A person, Allah warned you not to despair, but the person who didn't heed that warning and still despaired anyway and didn't come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what are they saying on the day of judgment? Ya hasrata ala ma farratu fi jambillah. Remorse. How could I do that? I messed up. I know I messed up. Wa in kuntu namina sakhreen. I remember the sins that I used to commit. I remember being amongst those who used to mock. I remember that. I'm not denying anything. He's despairing on the day of judgment too. His attitude hasn't changed. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The ayah that Sheikh Yasser left off with, which was, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا I want to continue into the next four or five ayah to help understand that verse better. Because with this ayah, usually it's quoted just to say, look, don't despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the next five ayat are the consequences of despairing from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Allah azza wa jal first talks about that issue of despair. La taqnatu min rahmatillah. Do not despair from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because Allah says it right away. Allah forgives all sins. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His attributes is ghafoorun rahim. He covers your sins and He will forgive them and He will not hold you accountable for them as long as you seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's forgiveness. Now there are two ways of looking at that. There is the Shafi'i way and not the Fiqhi Shafi'i way. There is the way Imam al-Shafi'i looked at that. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, he explained that whenever you commit a sin, لا تنظر إلى المعصية Don't look at the size of the sin itself. لكن انظر إلى من عصيت Look at the one that you have disobeyed, Al-Kabir, Al-Azim, the Almighty. Meaning what? It might be a really, really small sin in its nature. But the attitude that you have with that sin makes it extremely great. Right? Because look at who you're disobeying. It's not about the size of, look, getting a parking ticket in Dallas, Texas is different from getting a parking ticket in front of the White House. Okay? Depending where you are. Depending on the circumstances, the same transgression can have, you know, can have far greater consequences. And so Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah saying, don't look at the size of the sin, but look at the one that you have disobeyed. So you might think to yourself, well, wow, if every single time I commit a sin, I'm going to say, I just disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm going to be scared. I'm going to run away. I'm going to say, you know what, I have no hope in life. But look at that same person at Imam al-Shafi'i when he was dying, when he calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ilahi, my Lord, I have brought with me to this moment, to this interview with you, many sins. I'm covered in sins. I have mountains of sins. Now, do you ever hear about a Shafi'i backbiting? Do you ever hear about a Shafi'i doing anything lewd? Do you ever, can you ever find a sin of a Shafi'i? But he's saying, Ya Allah, I have many sins because of how he considers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he said, but when I looked at your rahmah, when I looked at your mercy, I recognized that a little bit of your mercy is all that I need to forgive a lot of my sins. Those were his last words. SubhanAllah. He said, so forgive me for a lot of my sins with a little bit of your rahmah, with a little bit of your mercy. That's all I need. You see that? SubhanAllah. He considers the sin great because of how great he considers Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because of how much Allah means to him. You know, that's something in the heart. How you consider Allah, the attitude that you have. You know, I always look at the way Salih ibn Kaysan rahimahullah, when he described Umar ibn Abdul Aziz to his father. And he said, مَا رَأَيْتُ أَحَدًا اللَّهُ أَعْظَمُ فِي صَدْرِهِ مِنْ هَذَا الْغُلَامِ I've never seen anyone to whom Allah means more. Like Allah is greater in his chest than that young man, than Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. I've seen Sahaba. I've never seen anyone like him that thinks of Allah higher than him. So you're thinking of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your fear of, that, of the size of that sin, that attitude that you have when you commit that sin represents how you feel about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's really what this is all about. Think about it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives this man that kills a hundred people. The last one of them being a worshiper. Right? Does anyone know anything about the other 99 people? How many lives were destroyed by the other 99 people? or by his murder of the other 99 people. You know, but the fact that that man considered Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as great, feared the consequences of his sin, was willing to just make a move.
to another land to start over and count it on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that murder of a hundred people became insignificant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas you take a small sin, but you don't care about it. You're consistently committing that same sin over and over and over again. The Prophet ﷺ says, beware of belittling your sins. You're consistently doing the same sin over and over and over again. And the Prophet ﷺ gave the example of someone that's consistently throwing small pieces of wood into a fire until eventually the fire gets so big that it consumes you. Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he said, take the biggest stone, but keep on, keep on dropping a small drip of water on the same spot over and over and over again. Eventually the entire stone will erode. Belittling sins, the attitude that you have with that small sin, that is offensive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That you have reduced Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the lowest of your observers. And Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala, he once heard a line of poetry and he went back to his home at night reciting that line of poetry to himself over and over and over again, crying. Abdullah says until his son, until the time that Fajr came, Ida ma qala li rabbi, amastahiyayta ta'asini, wa tukhfid dhamba an khalqi wa bil isyani ta'atini. I'm afraid Allah will tell me on the day of judgment. Weren't you ashamed of disobeying me? Hiding that sin from creation. You were more worried about other people seeing you commit the sin. And coming to me full of disobedience. Oh, imagine if you were, you know, the attitude that you have when you commit a sin in private, for example, and you're not worried because no one else is catching you or watching you. The attitude, you know, really what you're saying when you're willing to commit that sin over and over again. Oh, it's just Allah watching me right now. Alhamdulillah. It's just Allah. And Abu Jandar radiallahu anhu said, In kuntum tarawna anna Allah la yarakum. If you think Allah doesn't see you, fa antum mushrikuna bih. That's a sign of disbelief. Wa in kuntum tarawna anna hu yarakum. And if you see that Allah is watching you when you're committing your sins, why did you reduce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ahwan al nadirina ilayk, the lowest of your observers? And Allah Azza says about the believer, The believers, whenever they commit a sin, something shameless in its nature, they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's who comes to mind, not, oh man, people are going to find out and say this about me now. That's not what comes to their mind. Those are secondary things. But it's, oh, how could I do this? In front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, using the, the, the faculties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to me while Allah was watching me in a land that belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sustaining myself with the sustenance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, knowing that I'm going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again and have to explain myself about this. How could I do that? And so Al-Fudayl, Al-Fudayl ibn Iyad rahimahullah, he sums it up. He says, as for the sin, the more that you consider it saghir, little, the more it becomes big to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It becomes kabir to Allah. It becomes a major sin to Allah. The more minor you consider it, the more major it becomes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more major you consider your sin, the more minor and insignificant it becomes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah won't mind, no matter what you've done, as long as you're recognizing who you're seeking forgiveness from. As long as you feel a general, a genuine sense of shame, I disobeyed Allah, my creator, my sustainer, and I still disobeyed him. And Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, he described that. It's like a man, he said, the believer is like someone who treats his sins like a mountain on his back that's overburdening him. It might be a, you know, think about it. When you go through the seerah and you see Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu grabbing his tongue and crying and saying, that this has led me to dangerous places, chastising himself. Do you ever see Abu Bakr cursing, backbiting, you being foul? No, but that's how great he considers Allah. Whereas Ibn Mas'ud says, the wicked person, the fasiq, considers his sins like a fly on his nose. Just swat it out the way. I don't care. So you should never reduce Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your sight because you're only reducing yourself. And you know, I want to give you this example. It's a very powerful example. Abdullah bin Abbas, عنه, one time he's sitting and he's with his students. Somebody walks in and says, if I killed a man, could I be forgiven? He said, yes, of course. I mean, Allah forgave the man who killed a hundred people. Yeah, you could be forgiven for that. So the man left. 
Another man comes in and asks him the same question. If I killed the man, would I ever be forgiven? He said, nope. He was blown away. And the students were like, wait, what, what just happened here? Now in our creed, in our aqidah, there is no doubt that a major sin does not take a person out of Islam. He can be forgiven. Why did you tell the second guy no? And what makes it more confusing is that you just told someone a few minutes before him, yes. He said, because the first person that came in actually killed somebody. I could tell, that's the firasa, that's the way they could see the people in front of him. I could tell that guy just killed somebody. And he felt bad about it. And he was seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I'm telling him, yes, Allah will forgive you. He said the second guy, on the other hand, wanted to kill somebody. Like he was coming to get a license to kill, literally. Have you got, you've gotten to a point where you're, where you're planning your sins now, right? Like I'm going to sin in a week, and I know I'm going to sin in a week, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to ignore all the thoughts between now and then that tell me don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to take our sins seriously, but you know, there's a difference between someone who's defined by his sin and someone who's defined by his tawbah, his repentance. I'll give you an example. Iblis. Does anybody care about the thousands of years of worship he had before he committed that sin? No. Because he allowed that sin to define him. Ablasa. He despaired. Washatana. He distanced himself from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's defined by his kibir. He's defined by his pride. He's defined by his sin because when he came to the recognition that he disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he didn't turn back to Allah. He turned away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rendering those thousands of years of worship absolutely worthless. Whereas you take people that have done things far worse than that. Far worse than what Iblis committed at that moment. I mean, obviously, he's got a lot of, that he's done since then. But far worse than what he did at that moment. And you look at a person like Yunus alayhi salam. Is Yunus defined by his sin or is he defined by his repentance? He's defined by his tawbah. Oh Allah, I messed up. I'm calling upon you from a place no one has ever called you from before. I'm calling you from the stomach of a whale. I'm not despairing. I'm not giving up on you, oh Allah. رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا and, and he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكَ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ An expression of Allah's perfection and an expression of His own imperfection. I wronged myself. What does Allah say? فَجَتَبَاهُ رَبُّ Allah chose him. وَجَعَلَهُ مِنَ الصَّالِحِينَ And made him from the righteous. He was better off than he was before that. Why? Because his repentance. And Rasulullah said, no person is in a hardship and calls upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with that dua of Yunus alayhi salam, except that Allah will alleviate that hardship. Why? Because that's who Yunus is. He's defined by that, his repentance. And you go through the history of Islam, you find people that really did some really, really messed up stuff. I mean, Abdullah bin Mubarak rahimahullah, there is no man in the history of Islam after the Sahaba who has more books written about his virtues than Abdullah bin Mubarak. And he was a party animal. He used to drink. He was a musician. His house was party central in Maru, in Iran. Party central was Abdullah bin Mubarak's house. But his tawbah is what defines him. Malik ibn Dinar rahimahullah. His tawbah is what, I mean, the guy was a drunk, didn't pray for 17 years. Killed his daughter because he was drunk and irresponsible while he was playing with her. Threw her by accident. But his tawbah defines him, not his sin. Fudayd ibn Ayyad, the guy that I just mentioned, rahimahullah ta'ala, was an adulterer. He said, I used to go commit adultery every single night with the same person out in the open. And he said that during the day I was a qati' tariq, I was a highway robber. But he's defined by his repentance. He's not defined by his sin. Because when he changed, he changed. He used that recognition that, man, I've really messed up to bring him close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the next few ayat, Allah Azza wa then says, وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهُ Turn back to your Lord and submit yourself to Him. مِنْ قَبْلِ أَنْ يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابِ See, it's a threat. That's why we don't read the next ayat. We read the nice ones. The next one's a threat. Before the punishment comes to you, ثُمَّ لَا تُنْصَرُونَ And then no one is going to help you then. No one's going to come to your aid at that point. وَاتَّبِعُوا أَحْسَنَ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ And follow the guidance. Don't try to make, don't try to find loopholes. Look, you want to make tawbah? Make tawbah sincerely. Don't condition your tawbah. Don't try to find ways out of your tawbah. Follow the guidance as it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam min qabli an ya'tiyakum al-'adhabu baghta before the punishment comes to you suddenly wa antum la tash'urun you won't even feel it coming now allah azza wa jalla has mentioned here three different diseases Allah is giving you three warnings here in this life and the worst of them is certainly despair because that's shaitan. A person who's just given up and doesn't care anymore. Allah gives you three warnings here. The first warning, don't despair. The second warning, no one's going to help you. The third warning, don't procrastinate. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then fast forwards to the scene of the day of judgment. أَن تَقُولَ نَفْسٌ يَا حَسْرَةَ عَلَى مَا فَرَّتُ فِي جَنْبِ اللَّهِ a person, Allah warned you not to despair, but the person who didn't heed that warning and still despaired anyway and didn't come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what are they saying on the day of judgment? Ya hasrata ala ma farratu fi jambillah. Remorse. How could I do that? I messed up. I know I messed up. Wa in kuntuna min as I remember the sins that I used to commit. I remember being amongst those who used to mock. I remember that. I'm not denying anything. He's despairing on the Day of Judgment too. His attitude hasn't changed. It's just compounded on the Day of Judgment. An attitude of despair. An attitude of, I know I'm messing up, but I'm not doing anything about it because I'm, I'm, I can't get any better. It's like the bum on the street, right? Get up, change. Oh, I've messed up so how, Who's going to consider me for a job? I'm not even going to try to get a job. How am I? I've messed up too much. And on the Day of Judgment, that person is still despairing. Remorse. Nadam is good. Regret is good when it turns you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remorse is bad when it turns you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the Day of Judgment, I'm not denying anything, but I didn't do anything about it. Despaired from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every time I thought about getting better, shaitan came to me and reminded me about how messed up of a person I am. So a person comes and says, and I'm serious, I hear this all the time, right? I can't wear hijab, I don't pray. I can't fast, I don't pray. I can't pray, I don't fast. I can't go to hajj, I have haram money. Shaitan gets you thinking backwards, not forward, not, well, you know what, so that my fast can be acceptable, let me make sure my salah is good too. So that my hajj can be accepted, let me get rid of the haram stuff too. Shaitan always gets you this way, he wants you to fall back. He tells you before you commit a sin, Allah is gonna forgive you, don't worry about it. After you commit a sin, how could you do that? What a horrible person you are. No hope. And on the day of judgment, that person is still beating himself up. Hasra. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, what was the second warning? Does anybody remember? I said the first warning was despair. What was the second warning? Thumma antum la tunsarun. No one is going to come to your aid. You know how there are some people that are just so used to other people coming to their aid? Like I mess up, it's alright, this guy is going to pick me up. She's going to get my back. Right? Well, everybody else is committing this wrong, so there must not be anything wrong with it. Everybody else is doing it, right? So there's nothing wrong with it. You know, I'm just going with the flow. I'm going with status quo. A person of no character, a person who does not stand out, a person who doesn't question their environment, doesn't question their culture, does, because everyone else is doing it. A person that is a sheep by nature and not a shepherd. A person that is a follower by nature and not a leader. A person that is weak by nature and not strong. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says on the Day of Judgment, same personalities. The weak people are still running to those that were prideful in this world and saying, get us away out of here. Because you've become so dependent on other people. You've become so dependent on, on, on you know, you've become so complacent. That, well, this person could do this, this person could do that, this person will come to my aid. You blame other people when you fail and you look to other people to rescue you whenever you're failing. You're dependent. And what's that person saying on the Day of Judgment? Or that person says, if Allah would have guided me, I'm not recognizing I messed up. If Allah would have guided me, I would have been from those who are aware, those who are righteous. I would have been from the believers. I would have been good if Allah would have guided me. Because who are you going to blame now? And that's shaitan too. All of these are a manifestation of shaitan. Shaitan blames Allah. Bima aghwaitani. Because you led me astray. I'm going to lead all of them astray too. He blames Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the third thing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Aw taqula, law anna li karra fa akuna min al muhsineen. What was the third warning? Procrastination. All right, so you've got the first guy that despairs. 
You've got the second person that blames others for their failure and depends upon others for their success. A person of no character and Allah saying that person will blame Allah, not, not fess up to their actions. And you've got the third person who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, whenever they see the punishment, when punishment's right in front of their face, hellfire's right there. If Allah gives me another chance, not only am I going to be a believer, I'm not just going to be a, a, an, an average Muslim. I will be from the muhsineen. I'll be a person of ihsan. I'll be a person who excels. I'll be a person who worships Allah as if I could see Him. Why? Because some people need to see to believe. Some people are taken from ilm al yaqeen the knowledge, certain knowledge to ayn al yaqeen on the day of judgment, certainty in front of them. I knew, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you receive your book in your right hand, we ask Allah to make us from those people, what would they say? Inni dhanantu anni mulaqin hisabi. I knew this day was coming. I was prepared for it. I was aware of it. I didn't need to see Jannah to know that it exists. I didn't need to see Hellfire to know that it exists. I didn't need to see Allah to know that He exists. I was ready for it. Mentally, I was emotionally prepared for it. I was working for it. That other person though, waits. Allah says, before adab comes to you, punishment will snatch you. And you won't even see it coming. Wait. He knows his capabilities. I know what I'm capable of doing. But I've got time. I'm still young. I've got time. I've got time. Everything will be okay. I've still got my whole life ahead of me. After college, I'll get serious. I'll get married and I'll get serious. After this, I'll get serious. And you know what? After you get married, you'll say, after I get my business taken care of, I'll get serious. After I get my kids, I'll get serious. I'll get serious. I'll get serious. That person will not wake up until they see hellfire in front of them. And they won't even deny their abilities. They'll say, oh Allah, if, you give me, if I have another chance, I'm not just going to be a Muslim. I'll be a muhsin. I'll be, a I'll be an amazing Muslim. I'll, be, I'll do amazing things, right? I'll be, you know, going all over the world, doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'll dedicate my life. Don't be that person who procrastinates. Because, you know, that person, even as you're dying, that person says, Rabbi rji'oon. Oh Allah, take me back. La'alli a'malu salihan fima tarakt. You know, the ulama, they say that this ayah is actually talking about a person as he's departing. You're not even dead yet and you're saying, take me back. Take me back. So I can do good with that which I have left behind. It was just one word and your death came to you. Didn't Allah warn you? Didn't Allah tell you it would come to you quick and you wouldn't have a chance? And I end with this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about that person because that's where I think many people fall into. That disease of procrastination, that disease of, well, you know, I've got time. And since this is a primarily youth audience, I've got time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran as He's describing to us the incredible scene of the Day of Judgment. The sky is bursting, the sun losing its luster, the stars falling, the earth being ripped apart, the mountains look, floating around like pegs, everything around you just falling apart. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu when he heard Rasulullah start to receive the revelation talking about all of these things happening he said a person will know at that moment what he has brought forth and what he has left behind and then the ayah came exactly as he said it the revelation came in his words that on that day a person will know two things what I brought forth. You know, you know how in the movies when a person's dying, they start to have all those flashbacks? You know, that's actually real. It really is. Seriously, no joke, it's real. As a person is dying, they start to review their lives. You know, subhanAllah, I was listening to a psychologist, they said that in your dying moments, in 20 seconds, you have the, your mind has the capability of reviewing 80 years. In 20 seconds. I was blown away when I heard her say that. I forgot the name, subhanAllah, but it's 20 years. I mean, 80 years and 20 seconds. A person starts to go through flashbacks, flashback after flashback after flashback after flashback after flashback. And you will know two things. You'll start to remember all the times you disobeyed Allah and you said, I've got time, everybody else is doing it, or I, I have no hope anyway. You'll start to remember all of those sins that you committed. But you know what else you'll remember? Ma akharat. 
what you left behind, your potential, what you were capable of doing, the time that you wasted, the moments that you had a chance to put it forward, to put your best foot forward, but you didn't. The moments of your youth, the moments of your health, the moments of your free time, the moments of your, of your, of your financial stability, the moments of your life that you had a chance, but you didn't do your best. And seriously, if this question doesn't bother you on the day of judgment, I'm gonna ask you this question, and it's a question that you need to ask yourself. And every single one of us needs to ask ourselves. And I mean everyone from the speakers to the organizers to the volunteers to the attendees. When you stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, will you be able to say to Allah, I tried my best. I gave it my all. I tried. With every breath that you gave me, with every moment of free time that you gave me, with every talent that you gave me, with every moment of health, I did my best, O oh Allah. I tried. If you can say that to Allah, haniyan lak, you're good, alhamdulillah. If you can make, if you, and just ask yourself now, if I could say that to Allah now, I'm good. But as Abu Darda radiallahu anhu said, I'm not afraid of Allah asking me on the day of judgment, how much do you memorize and how much knowledge do you have? I'm afraid of Allah asking me, what did you do with that knowledge? You knew better. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is merciful enough that if we made any effort whatsoever, He'll forgive us. He will show mercy to us, no matter how disgusting the transgressions could be. But at the same time, you've got to be able to say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I tried. I knew I was going to meet you, O oh Allah, and I tried. And I failed sometimes, but I tried. Whenever I fell, I got back up. I tried, I tried, I tried, I tried. And we have a Lord that is so merciful that He will say, okay, don't worry about it. <laughs> that He will cover up your sins for you that he will bring your good deeds to patch up your, your deficiencies in your salah, your deficiencies in your fasting, that he will say, don't worry about it, that he will comfort you to a point that he'll take those sins. And you know, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, and this is my last point, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings the servant, Rasulullah sallallahu said, that as he's reading his sins, and this is the believer now, Allah starts to change those sins into good deeds, it's for two reasons. Number one, because in al hasanat yudhibna sayyat, ulaika yubadil Allah sayyatim hasanat, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so merciful that He actually does change your sins to good deeds. But why does Allah make you read them first before He changes them? So that you can know for a fact that Allah has forgiven you. Because when you read them, and it's not reading a book, it's HD replay, it's right in front of you. Right in front of you. You see it right in front of you and you go through that, you will change colors, the Prophet ﷺ said, thinking that you're done for. You have no hope in life. You have no hope in, in, in Jannah. And Allah wants you to see those being changed to good deeds out of His mercy to the point that the Prophet ﷺ said that the servant will say to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I have some sins that the angel forgot to write down. I was changing colors because I felt doomed a minute ago. Now I'm like, oh Allah, there is one time that I did this, but the angel forgot to write it down. Because you're experiencing the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How awesome is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how deserving is Allah of our best effort. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy upon us, to forgive us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who do not despair, who do not depend on anyone but Him, who turn to Him whenever they sin, seek forgiveness from Him, and have resolved because of their love for Him not to return that sin, not to return to that sin, and who do not procrastinate in changing themselves. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Muqallib al qulub thabbit qulubna ala deenik. O turner of hearts, make our hearts firm on your deen. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Wassalamu alaikum.